I want to start us off this morning, and I, I'm going to share a, a little bit of a, um, of a thought that, that haunts me. There's a, there's a thought that haunts me as a pastor. There's a thought that haunts me as a Christian, as one who acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of the living God and that what, what I'm called to is to every day, as Jesus said, if anybody that wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And the whole purpose of that is so that as, as I die to self, I become more like Christ. Here's the thought that haunts me, is that the, the picture that I would create in my heart and my mind that looks like success and looks like being transformed in, into the likeness of Christ may not be the right picture, especially as, as a pastor and, and, and shepherding a church. There, there's, there's certain measurables that we look at in, in Western culture, um, church attendance, church size, um, uh, stewardship of finances, leadership. We could, we could run down and have this exhausted list of, of good things, but I don't know that it's the list that marks the image of Christ. And so there's, there's this thought that haunts me that, that and, and you got you to gotta know that the team, that we, we, we truly, we are open-handed with this body and, and we're saying, Father, this is, this is your thing. This is your house. These are your people. And we all are striving to grow into the likeness of Christ. And, and we, we've been asking lately if there's anything that, is, that, that we have our hands to, if there's anything that we, we are about that is not a picture of what you have in mind of, of growing in Christ, then, then let it fade away. Because what I don't want to do, what we don't want to do as a team, is, is shepherd the church towards something that is Americanized rather than the kingdom of heaven. And you, you have to know, and I'm not asking for empathy, I'm not sharing that so that you know the, the cross that I bear or anything like that. I'm just sharing this with you so that you know that there's, there's a certain element of, of um, delicacy and... Um, Man, even a bit of curiosity where I'm perpetually asking my Heavenly Father, are we doing this right? Are we becoming the picture that we are supposed to be becoming? I don't want the picture of the church to be confusing to the rest of the world. I heard the, 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 where this started stirring for me was at, at the Foursquare Convention, where it's down in Nashville, Tennessee this past year, and we, we had an opening speaker who was, talking about, who was talking about the picture of the church. And he shared this story with us where he was flying from one place to another to speak, and he, there were arrangements made for him to be picked up. And he's more advanced in age, and so he, he's just come to this point in life where he just doesn't like to wait. He wants things to just be ready for him and, and, and work smoothly, seamlessly, and that sort of thing. And so he gets off the plane, gets to his destination, and goes to the baggage claim in a hurry because he doesn't like to wait. And, and he gets his bags, and, and everybody else has since come around him, met up with their people, and they, they've gone. And, and so he starts walking around trying to find the person that was there to pick him up. And, and so the, the, the amount of people that he was passing back and forth, back and forth, began to dwindle and diminish to where eventually, after a half an hour, and he was really frustrated at this point because he doesn't like to wait, and he was, he was expecting to be picked up right away, and so eventually it's just him and one other man. And this man stops him, and he says, he pulls out this picture from his jacket, and he looks at it, and then looks at him, and then looks at it and looks at him and looks again and then looks at him. And he goes, and the pastor's name is uh, Bishop Ulmer. And he goes, Bishop Ulmer? 
And he goes, yeah, that's me. He goes, I've been looking for you the last half hour. And he goes, you don't look like your picture. You don't look like your picture. Is what he told him. And he showed him this outdated picture with a big afro on his head. (laughs) And it just, it did not look like him. And then he, he, this pastor, Pastor Ulmer, transitions to this statement. He says, there are people who pass the church every day. And they're missing it because the church does not look like its picture. They're trying to find hope. They're trying to find this message of grace. They're trying to find this truth. They're trying to find this picture of the church. And they're not finding it because the church that exists today doesn't look like its picture. And in that moment, there was, there was um, just a, a, a cut in the heart, which only fueled that concern that I already had of like, Father, we, are, we doing, are we doing this in such a way that we are becoming the picture that we have in front of us? Y- y'all got to know that I have no interest I'm not completely interested in in making our gatherings an issue of comfort or even an issue of of safety. And what I mean by that is is like safety. Yeah, yeah, this is a safe place. Your kids are safe. You're safe. It's not, you know, we don't have to sing the song, hide your kids, hide your wife. You know, none of that. Um, You're you're safe. It's a good place. But in, in regards to our faith and the places that he's drawing us to, I, um, I don't want us to play it safe. And so I truly believe that there is a picture that we are becoming as we, and just as he was saying, I hate to wait, I hate to wait, I hate to wait. The, the greatest way that we will become the picture of the church that we are to be is by waiting Amen. in his presence. I love, um, Summer didn't uh, share this in the second service but in the first service, that, that, that declaration, that song, um, my melody is, is, is really my war cry. And so there's a, there's a difference of fighting your battles and winning them. See, that happened in Scripture where people would, God would empower people to fight battles and win. And that's, that's a, a demonstration of his authority through you. But then there were battles that were won where they, all they did was worship. And what that shows is his authority and our sonship and daughtership, that we belong to him. And I think those battles are the most challenging ones for us to win because we so want his authority to flow through us it's almost as if we're, we would rather that happen than be completely satisfied with being his son and daughter and watching him win the battles. It's all about posture. And it's all about an understanding of who we are. It's about being his, not doing things to be his. And so, do we look like the picture it's a question that haunts me. And um, I think until Jesus comes back, we're always going to, it's kind of like y- y'all know, some of y'all would know the age of uh, polar age, right? And you take the picture and you shake it. And you thought it sped things up, but I don't know that it did. <laughs> and so where we are right now in these days is we are waving this Polaroid. We're waving this, this picture so that when we glance at it and we see the picture come into to clarity, we can tell if we are becoming the picture. Now, we're going to go to 
an interesting section of verses this morning, and I'm going to I'm going to ask us to do something. This this message today is just slathered in metaphor, and it's a it's a visual metaphor that is not easy for us in this day and age to grasp because there's an act that is taking place that we don't see demonstrated at all in our day. Psalm 133 is where we are. This is a a song written by David. And the phrase, it is like, is this version, is the Bible version of an Instagram account. It is like. And this is how the scripture begins. How good and pleasant. Y'all say good and pleasant. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. In the New Testament, there's a, I don't know which, I don't know where the landing spot is, but I just know it's in there. Where it is our unity within the body of Christ that reveals to the world the kingdom of heaven. Like, it's, it's only within the, in the, the context of church where different cultures, ethnicities, languages, beliefs, all of, the, all of the different differences that we could come up with can come together under the name of Jesus. And not just be cordial with one another, but be united in heart together. There's no other entity that exists in the world like the church. And it is the unity within the church that gives people an idea and a picture of the kingdom of heaven. And so David, I mean, I don't know that he's writing about church per se, but this is very church-like where he says how good and pleasant it is when brothers, and I would even say sisters, but I'm going to be slow to that one and you'll see in a second, when brothers and sisters live in harmony. Y'all say good and pleasant. I know y'all woke up this morning, you're like, man, I just hope to learn some Hebrew. I want to learn some Hebrew for my, you know, my, my casual conversation throughout the week. Good and pleasant. These are two obviously different words, good and pleasant. The first Hebrew word is tov. Y'all say tov. It means agreeable to the senses, valuable in estimation, good understanding. It's intellectual in nature. Good. Can, write, can any of you right now think of anything that is agreeable to your senses? Taste, touch, sound, sight, all of, all of the five. I know I left one out, but that's agreeable to your senses. Y'all know what mine is. It's not a surprise. Um, bacon. <laughs> Last night, what was agreeable to, agreeable to my senses was the wedding cake. You know, sometimes you go to a wedding and it's like eating chalk. And I go, it's all good. And blah, and it's just, you're just being polite. But last night's cake, I almost, I just, I almost wanted to make a scene. That's how agreeable to the senses that cake was. My goodness. Then, oh, they had mac and cheese with lobster meat in it. Game changer. It was so agreeable to my senses that I sent Aubrey back for seconds. <laughs> Before I realized that some tables hadn't gone yet, and then I called her back, but she'd already gotten it, so I ate it anyways. So how good, how agreeable to the senses. Now, m- mind you, how good it is when brothers live in harmony. Are, are our senses... That agreeable when we see harmony within the church. 
Like that, that's a great picture of what we should strive for, where there's such unity. Yeah, I know where you stand and this and that and the other, but man, under the covering of Christ, there's harmony, and it is agreeable to the senses. It's good, how good and how pleasant. Now, this one's really interesting because even Tove, Tove in the breakdown of what it means, every line said pleasant. So why would David say how pleasant, pleasant? Is it? Well, this one has a bit different, a bit different tone to it. And here's your next Hebrew word. The first one's tov. The next one is naim. Naim. It means delightful, agreeable. We already said agreeable. There's a lot of overlap, but here's the distinguisher. It's sweet sounding and musical. So not only is it agreeable to the senses and what we just talked about, but it's also sweet-sounding when brothers and sisters live in harmony. We shouldn't be surprised that David, who started out in the fields playing a harp and singing songs, that he would have such a a song-centered set of lyrics here. So melodious. When brothers are in harmony, it sounds good. So here's some questions that come to my mind when I, when I hear that. For you personally, and this is kind of going towards the, the question that we're going to ask for today, what would be the soundtrack to your life? You personally. What is your personal soundtrack? And you can, you can make it churchy, you can make it not churchy. You know, summer, that's one of the things that we don't even realize it, but it seems like most moments in our family's life, we can sing a song to it. I don't, I don't know where it just comes. And there's songs I didn't even know I knew, but a moment will bring it up, and then people are like, that, that's a weird, weird association, but I see what you did there. But we, we just, we love to bring music into moments. I'm curious, though. With the moments of your life, what is the music that is pumped through your moments? Now, I can think of a lot of not good songs that would exemplify some of my moments. (laughs) I won't won't even hum them. (laughs) Just be like, Pastor, I didn't know you knew that song. And then there are some other songs where those moments that strike the heart of God, where you know that he's smiling and you know that you, you hit the mark, where it's, and they're good songs. But I'm just curious for you, what is, what is the soundtrack of your life? Here's where it's important corporately. The sound that those who know you but don't know Jesus, the sound that they hear come out of you is what they will connect to the church. Let me say that one more time. Because the sound that those who know you but don't know Jesus will connect your sound to the church because you're, you're here. And, and there are people that know you're here right now. But I wonder... If the, um, man, I'm, I'm horrible with lyrics, but the, the song that we were just singing this morning, na, 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 my melody, you know, the melody is, is what I sing over the unbelief, and I'm hodgepodging the lyrics like crazy, but we sing that now, but I wonder how well the rest of the songs throughout the week match what you're singing here, because what's pumped through your week is what people will see of the church. That's why it's important. So what what tove, what estimations does this community make based upon our unity? Because people people who don't go to church are, are calculating to see if what they vaguely know of the church to see if it adds up in our gathering. 
What naim, what melody does our unity make in our community? Let me say that one more time. What melody does our unity make within our community? You know some songs that you just, they're just good songs. And, and there, there are some where all of us could sing it. Now, I know that we all have different tastes in here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing one just to see if you all know it. And if you know it, you can sing it with me so I don't sound as bad. <laughs> sitting in the morning sun, I'll be sitting when the evening comes, watching the ships roll in, and I'll watch them roll away again. Mm. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> So, so you see what happens there is when there's a familiar song that's soothing and that we know we can all slide in to that song. I wonder if the catchiness of the sound of unity here would compel those who are unfamiliar with the song to learn the song and get into that song. So it's not, it's not rocket science. It's just intentionality to be bent on unity. How good and pleasing is it when brothers live in harmony? Here's the part where it gets way abstract for us, and I'm going to ask us to put on our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes, because this, what we're going to unpack here in the next few minutes, is so foreign to us, and I'm going to do my best to explain the significance of what's being written here, because David is providing for us an Instagram account of what the church looks like. It is like, here's your Polaroid. This is what the church is like. It is like fine oil on the beard, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's... Oh, wait, I'm sorry. It is like fine oil on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. That's all the further we're going to make it today. We'll pick up the next portion next week. But let's unpack this fine oil. I think it's interesting that the word fine is the same word that David used for how good. So this, it's like fine oil. It's like this oil where you can estimate its value. It's like fine oil that is poured out on the head. Y'all say on the head. On the head. Now, throughout Scripture and throughout history, there have been three landing spots when it comes to oil. One is a dab. You stick your finger in the oil and you dab things. And it, it, they all kind of have the same vibe to it. it. There's a consecrating, a setting apart or empowering element or aspect to anointing with oil, with olive oil. And there were specific groves that were grown for special oil, for special uh, purposes. And so this is fine Oil. It is fine oil. You know what I'm saying? It's fine. For a specific purpose. And you can either dab it or another example is you can smear it. And this is kind of like peanut butter on a cracker where it's, you see what I'm doing here? I'm, I'm smearing the peanut butter, right? I'm not going to eat this because I'd be shot the rest of the service. But it's this smearing, right? And that's the imagery of fine oil being poured out. Then there's another kind of example that is common. And I, I don't have a mannequin, and I'm pretty sure nobody wants me to ruin their clothes today. But where it's poured out where you uncork the bottle and you just let it go. And this is how priests and kings would be 
consecrated, um, released in the anointing, released in a calling. It would be this defining moment where oil was poured over them to prepare them for the next season. There's a couple. I asked for permission if I could share this, but right here in the front row, they got a new house together. God did a miraculous work in their life. He said, hey, can you guys come over and pray? I was like, here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you're going to hear us pray in the spirit. So we're going to pray in an unknown tongue. And, and we're going we're gonna to dump oil around your home because God's doing a new work in your family and a new work in your home. And so we're going to, we're going to dab. We're going to dab some oil <laughs> over your doorposts. What's cool is just some recent conversations that was a few years ago now, and the prints are still there on the threshold, the doorposts of their every room in their house. I gave a cup to Tom, and he and Jen walked hand in hand around the parameter of their property, just dumping oil. And when he'd run out, he's like, Josh, come here. I ran out. I'm like, bro, take it easy. <laughs> and they walked the parameter of their home as an indication to set it apart and to anoint it with oil. And there's something, some really basic things in this act. I, these are worth, I think, writing down. There's, we'll land on this. There's a pervasive saturation when you pour oil out. There's a particular weight to it. And there is a sensible yet special movement of oil. Why are we going down? Remember, we're saying how good and pleasant it is when brothers live in harmony, where there's unity. That good and pleasant unity is like, the picture of that looks like a priest being anointed with oil. That begins at the... That begins on the... It begins on the head. Okay, say it with some confidence now. It begins on the head. It begins on the head. It begins on the head. The intellect. It is poured out on the head, over the head. And it runs down to the beard. Why the distinguishing element of the beard? Because the beard represented age. And wisdom and understanding, this, is, this, this act that is being done is being poured out over someone of understanding. And it flows, some translations say, to the hem of the garment. So it's sensible in that gravity is taking the oil from the top all the way to the bottom. Okay? Okay? Is any of this confusing so far? Are some of y'all curious how this applies to the picture of the church? Hang with me. So it goes on the head, the sum of who man is in the head, to the beard, an indication of age and wisdom, running down specifically Aaron's beard. Aaron is the first priest in the scriptures. So it's running down, so let me just attach this. In the New Testament, there's a, a, there's a section that says this, that you are a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I didn't sign up for that. I said I believe in Jesus and that he's my Savior. I didn't sign up for this whole priesthood thing. Well, tough. You are, you're part of a royal priesthood because you are givers of the hope that only can come through Jesus in you. And, and the priests would be givers of hope. Don't worry. There's no sacrifices that need to be done. There's no, no, you know, all the historical stuff that priests used to do, it looks a lot different now. Jesus did all that work. All we have to do is be carriers of that hope. And you've been anointed to do that.
I know some of you are still like so unmotivated by this. Man, I, th- I thought we'd like to do something better today. But if you can sow, if you can grab this, this will change the way you view your life. Runs down to the beard, Aaron's beard. Watch this. Aaron's name means light bringer. So if we are Aaron types who are priests who have been anointed on the head, the beard. I'm not talking about bearded ladies, okay? Um, The head, the beard, the garments, the, the garments of the priests. We, you, light bearers, light bringers, have been anointed to bring light to the community. And then it went to the end of the garment. So olive oil runs to the end of the garment. It starts on the head and ends on the hem. Here's what garment means, in case you wanted another Hebrew word. Y'all say middah. I'm in the middah of the week, you know what I'm saying? All right, so that'll help you remember. Middah. That word means a measured portion There is a garment that each of us wear that is a measured portion tailor-made just to you. Your portion is different, not greater, lesser, better, uglier, better, whatever, prettier, whatever. It's it's your portion that's been measured, and there is, this is what the church looks like when the oil is poured out over us, over our each of our unique portions portion that's been measured for us, each of us individually, as we are together in unity corporately or collectively, and we've been anointed from the head to the hem to be light bringers. So think about this. The oil is poured out first on the intellect, and it ends on the ground. And we don't have to, this is the imagery that we should have, where we have this, I mean, some of you guys will, will jive with this if you're into capes, all right? So rather than a garment or cloak or something, just think of a cape, superhero, all right? So don't worry about your cape dragging on the ground. Don't worry about it getting dirty. That's the whole point of the anointing going to that place. There is no destination that's too dirty for his anointing. There is no place too dirty for his oil. I don't know that y'all are grabbing this yet. There is no place in your heart that is too dirty for that oil to go. There is no place in our county, in our city, that is too dirty for that oil that has reached the hem of the garment to touch. So as that anointed garment touches those dirty places, we are light bringers, clothed as priests. So let's let's bring this in full picture. Jesus is our great high priest, and as we say yes to him, we are clothed in him, And we are anointed by his spirit, not just a trickle, not just a dab, not just a smudge, but an outpouring of his spirit on us so that when we walk around in our Jesus clothing, we bring light to every place that we go. And there's no place that's too dirty for that anointing. That should change the way you walk into work. Let's back up even further than that. That should change the way you go to home. Men, I just read this yesterday at a wedding. The husband is the head of the home. So that that sound, that good sound, starts with you. If you aren't clothed with Christ, and if you haven't said, 
pour your oil on me so that I'm anointed to be the head of the home as you've called me to be. Do it now. Do it. There, there may not be this like thing that shifts in your heart or a different mindset or anything like that, but, but do it in your, in your heart with understanding and say, Father, all that was just said, I don't even fully get it, but I know I want it, and so clothe me in Christ. Help me be the picture of the church where the oil is poured out on the head to the beard to the garment so that every place that I go, starting with my home, starting with my bedroom, starting with my living room, starting with my workplace, that I am a light bringer, anointed to do what he has set me apart to do. All right. Today's a fun one. Right now, if you were to write a title, if you were to write a title that matches the melody of your life, what would it be? You can borrow this one. I, I modified a little bit, but it takes two to make a thing go right. Since we believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it takes three to make a thing go right. Maybe that's your melody because I depend on the fullness of who God is. What's the, what's the title of the melody that your life sounds like? Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Have fun with it. I would also add this, that after you have the one that matches your current life, if it's not what you want it to be, right now, did you know that you can speak things prophetically over your own life? Maybe write a prophetic song title. Maybe it ain't no mountain. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low. But for you, it's a message of you walking through heights and lows, leaning into him. But what's your prophetic song title of your life? Take a minute, write those down. We will pick up part two next week. Here at Grow Point, we do this at the end of every message where we ask a question. You can respond to that question on the back of the connection card that was handed out. If you've been here for a long time and you, you know the, the role, you know the, the routine, but you don't do it, start today. Do it today. Make a declaration of your life.